When you wake up in the morning for a slice of toast, do you spread the butter on thickly, like jam? Or are you the kind of person who only applies a thin layer or even substitutes butter for low-fat spreads like this one? She wanted to remember the love they shared for butter, but cholesterol took away their passion until... I can't believe it's not butter. I can't believe it's not butter. The taste you love without the cholesterol. What a work of art. Amazing. That was an advert for I Can't Believe It's Not Butter from 1996, back in time. It's just one of the products that appeared on supermarket shelves after advice in the 80s told millions of us to avoid butter and full-fat milk in a bid to reduce deaths from heart disease. The thinking was that you're ingesting cholesterols and fats and they fur up your arteries. But now a review says the evidence did not support the advice and it's incomprehensible that such guys guidelines were introduced based on evidence from such a small number of men. So can we finally embrace butter? Are you a liberal butter spreader? Is there someone in your family who spreads it like it's jam in enormous quantities? 0500 288 291, email vine at bbc.co.uk. Does this vindicate them? You can spread it like jam. Let's talk to Zoe Harkham, the lead researcher for the review. And Zoe is with the Institute of Clinical Exercise and Health Science at the University of the West of Scotland. So, so what have you discovered, Zoe? Good afternoon, Jeremy. Hi. Yeah, what we discovered, essentially, we went back to look at the best evidence that there was available at the time the guidelines were introduced in 1983 for the UK, and the best evidence is what we call randomised control trials. There were only six, um, and they involved a very small number of people, as you pointed out, only men, so no women were studied, and only about 2,400 men were studied, most of whom had had a heart attack, so they're what we call secondary studies. And we're able to use a modern technique called meta-analysis to pull those results and when we do that we actually found that there were precisely the same number of deaths in the intervention groups as there were in the control groups at 370 apiece and there was no statistically significant difference in coronary heart disease deaths either. So so the, the two groups were butter eaters and non-butter eaters were they? Well essentially but not entirely there were a number of different dietary interventions so for example one group were given corn oil in addition to just eat normally but add corn oil another group were told to have soybean oil another group were told to follow a very low fat diet no more than 40 grams a day and that was the second interesting finding from our group at the University of West of Scotland and the finding was that the actual guidelines that came in no more than 30 percent of your diet in the form of total fat no more than 10 percent in the form of saturated fat they hadn't actually been tested by those six randomized controlled trials the final one in 1978 looked at the 10 percent saturated fat it didn't look at total fat and quite interestingly there were far more deaths significantly more deaths in the intervention group in that final study than in the control group Sorry, okay Jimmy. no no this is really interesting are we talking here about things that cause you to be fat or are we talking here about things that cause you to have a heart attack because they fur your arteries up? Because there's two different things. Yes, absolutely. Again, very good point. Um, at the time, the dietary guidelines were introduced in the name of coronary heart disease. So the condition that was the major subject of interest at the time was heart disease in both America and the UK. These dietary guidelines were introduced in the interest of doing something about heart disease. So what our study found was that it, there was not an association between fat intake, saturated fat intake whatever type of fat intake and deaths from coronary heart disease or deaths from any other cause but i thought when people have heart attacks and die and and they're opened up that you physically find deposits inside their arteries which are all the cheese and the butter they've eaten well no it's not exactly the cheese and the butter that are eaten what you'll find um, if you look at the lining of the artery it's called the endothelial wall that can suffer damage from a number of different things and we know that smoking is one of the things that can cause damage stress can d cause damage just over age um, time damage occurs that's why older people suffer far more heart attacks but the furring what's, what's the furring is that cholesterol or what well no what actually happens when there's damage to the arterial wall the body has to form a plaque over that damage it can't allow a scab to form because the scab could break away and then it would actually go loose into the arteries the blood vessels that would cause a problem so the body actually puts a plaque over the damage and then seeks to repair the damage and here's the ultimate irony and I'll tell you how it's been best put by a fellow researcher in a second. The irony is that what goes to the scene of that damage is something called LDL, which is a low density lipoprotein. So it carries cholesterol and protein and phospholipids and triglycerides to repair the damage that's done. 
So as a fellow researcher once said to me, it's like turning up at the scene of the crime and finding the police there and then accusing the police of causing the crime. How we will always find fat, cholesterol, the substances that repair every cell in the body, we will always find those at the scene of damage. That's why the body is making cholesterol 24-7. And are we allowed, all of us, particularly over the age of 40, to be a bit annoyed that we were told completely the wrong thing for years and years and years, namely that fat makes us fat and we now know it doesn't. Well, I think so. I, I have had a number of people, um, and I'm by no means the only person saying this. My fellow researchers are by no means the only people saying this. You know, there is a growing movement, particularly over the last two years, of looking at sugar as perhaps a main dietary problem rather than natural fats in natural foods that we've been eating for a long period of time. And I have come across people who've discovered um, people like Gary Tobes um, or Tim Noakes for themselves, and actually they do say they feel quite duped, they feel quite angry. Um, it wasn't evidence-based, and that's essentially what our study found. So Gary, Gary Torbs, who wrote a book called What Makes Us Fat, and his big theory is it's all refined carbohydrates, it's sugar, and it's white flour, processed flour, chiefly. Bread is of the devil. <laughs> um, so, but, I mean, this, we're only just hearing this now. This is crazy, isn't it? Well, there's a great quote from Gary Tobes, actually. He says, my wife says I blame everything on carbohydrates. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of, he does mostly in, in his research... Um, I think another important thing is to say um, that the consequence of the dietary guidelines, because a lot of people at the time said, oh, there can't be any harm. Surely if we just tell people to eat less fat, you know, that's no bad thing. But when you know that there are only three things that we eat, we call them macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein and fat. Protein tends to be pretty constant in the diet. So as soon as you tell somebody to eat less fat, you are concomitantly telling them to eat more carbohydrate. And I do think, and my fellow researchers um, would agree, that we need to look at the consequences of this dietary advice because we have eaten more carbohydrate, dramatically more carbohydrate. And obesity, of course, has increased tenfold in the past three decades. Thank you very much. Fascinating, Zoe. Cheers. Zoe Harkham, lead researcher for the review from the Institute of Clinical Exercise and Health Science at the University of the West of Scotland. She knows her stuff.